we have a great guest today. Yes. PLU Associate Head Coach Sean Taunt. PLU stands for Pacific Lutheran University. I'm going to start that over. Stand by. That's right. <laughs> what up, folks? How are you guys doing? So, we got a great. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little delirious. Only got a couple hours of sleep last night. Um, take you guys three. are a couple. You guys are a couple frames behind, so I'm trying to keep up. Okay. Oh. There you go. What up? How are you guys doing out there? Hey, we're doing great here at What Up Sports Nation. We got a special guest for you, Sean Taunt. Associate Head Coach at Pacific Lutheran University, one of my favorite coaches out there. Sean, how are you doing, brother? Good, man. How are you guys? We're doing good. We're doing good. Yeah. So, you want to start with the question? Anymore? We're going to ask about the story <laughs> that you were about to tell us, and I stopped it so we could have a part of the show. I want details of what happened. <laughs> no, you don't. Yes, what's going on here? I wish I still had the video on my phone. The last time, was that the last time you were in Washington? Second to last time. Okay. We had a poker tournament fundraiser at our at our facility, and late at night after we were done cleaning up and everything, Chris was there. I don't even remember why you were there. Did you play in the tournament? Yeah, I was playing in the tournament okay. and doing a camp. With yeah, you and so we had a football in the facility, and so Chris decided he wanted to go out for a pass. And so he, so he went out for a pass, and as he was running full speed down the facility, his freaking pants came, like his belt came undone or something, and his pants just dropped while he was running down the facility. Caught the ball. It was amazing. I caught the ball. Amazing. You did you catch the ball. It, time. it was It was amazing. Oh, so that, Anyway, that's, I'm having a hard time focusing because that's all I see when I see you. Is that is that, is that <laughs> yeah, I have that effect on you know one of the things that I like to talk is mindset. And I like the coach's perspective because it helps young ball players understand what coaches are looking for, how they're looking for, and all that kind of good stuff. Now, for you, you're looking for being D3, you're looking for something a little different than a D1, D2, and AIA. Um the mindset, I would have to say, because being D3, if I'm not mistaken, you're looking for a mentally strong ball player in the classroom and on the field, correct? We're very much a fringy Division I college baseball program, so we, we look for guys that have a couple of tools that'll play at that level. Um, you know, maybe they can run at that level, play defense at that level, but the bat's not quite there, for example, or you know, we'll take a kid that velocity wise on the mound, it can compete at a mid-major division one, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't command it or doesn't really have a second pitch behind it or something like that. So we will get him as a project instead because they don't need to do that at that level. They can take a kid that can do it all, you know. So for us, talent wise, you know, we're looking for a lot of the same things that they're looking for. It's just the kids that we're, that they're going to get have more of it, you know, like, We'll both like I've got two freshmen coming in this year that are six five and eighty five to eighty nine, but the command's not super good right now. And maybe you know one of them, the secondary stuff needs to get better. Whereas uh, like a University of Washington or a or a UCLA or something like that, they're going to get ninety one ninety three with command and probably a breaking ball behind it. You know, so there's just more polish at that level. Um, as far as mentality and attitude. Gosh, man, we just like guys that want to, that are going to come in and compete. I mean, that's it. Like when we go to, you know, I tell guys all the time here, uh, you know, that either have played for me in the summer or that we work with in the winter or, or whatever. Like when I go to a showcase, like I don't want to watch guys go get beat by fastball when they're hitting, right? Like it's not me personally, like it's not of interest to me to watch them spray the ball the other way and get, you know, hit a ground ball through the four hole at second base for a base hit. Like that's not of interest to me. Like that's not going to play at the next level when guys are throwing harder and can command it better and get a ball under your hands. So like for me personally, and I think a lot of schools that are good, I would recruit 
0 for 3 with three flyouts to the fence, 0 for 3 for 3 with three weak base hits the other way. Because the the flyouts to the fence are eventually going to go. And what that tells me about that player is that he's got hand speed, he's ready to hit fastball, and he can compete. So I want guys that that are going to come in and obviously you have to have the tools, like you have to have the power, you have to have the, the hand speed to compete, but I'm not really concerned with like approach or any of that when I go because they're high school kids and they really don't have one. Um, my concern is that when they're, when it's their turn to go hit, they're ready to hit and they're not going to get fastball thrown by them. Like if they get fooled on a curveball or something like that, whatever. I mean, that's what they're for but you have to be able to hit fastball and turn around a guy's best fastball. Like that has to be there. And it's kind of the same comp competitive mindset on the pitching side. I mean, I, if I'm going to go watch a guy pitch, I mean, his breaking ball, I mean, I, I'm going to pay attention to it and see how it is, but I want to see that he can take his fastball and compete with it and throw strikes and be, you know, go right after a hitter. You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I want to see when I go see a guy is, is he competing? Is he throwing strikes? Is he have a little bit of an edge to him? You know, I don't, it's really tough to recruit a kid that you feel like might be a little bit soft upstairs because it only gets tougher when they get into college. Right. And it's not a situation where we as a program want to do a whole lot of hand holding to kind of toughen somebody up. It's more like we want someone to have that competitive mindset and then we can teach them how to win and compete rather than have to teach them not to be afraid to compete and then worry about teaching them how to win. Cause it's, I mean, that takes a lot of time. So I don't know, man. We all want guys that we want to go to battle with, you know, that we feel like are going to show up ready to compete and play and and get after it every day. And so we tend to gravitate more towards the guys that aren't afraid to compete and get after it. You know, if you strike out three times, but you're way out in front or you take really good swings and you strike out, that's fine. You know, I'd rather have that than someone that is so far behind that they're spraying balls over the other dugout during their bat. That doesn't, I mean, they're just not ready to go. And that's a, that's a big turnoff, you know, in terms of, you know, what you're willing to work with when someone comes in as a freshman. So, you know, we, we compete for everything in our program. And so when we go to watch a kid, we want to see that he's ready to compete and that, you know, he's not afraid and he's, he's going to go get after it and, and be ready to go. As a coach, what would you say that you do well working with taking working with the young kids to working with professional athletes? Yeah, I mean, me personally, I've always approached it very similar. Um, you know, obviously, what changes is going to be what kind of stuff you're working on. But as far as dialogue and how you know, I approach things and, and how I talk to guys, it's going to be the same at, at 10, 11, 12, as it's going to be at 22 and, you know, in the big leagues. I mean, it's, I'm very, I'm really big on explaining why things need to happen and why it's a better way to go about things one way than the other, rather than just, I'm not a real big, like, I mean, there's, listen, there's a time and a place for, you know, you need to do it because I told you to, there's a time and a place for that for sure. But, you know, when I'm trying to get a point across as to why something needs to happen differently, I feel like it's important for athletes, especially nowadays, to learn what that's going to give them, what's going to be different about it. Like, why should they do it that way? Like, there's, you know, and it's not that they're, it's not that they're hesitant, it's that they just knew. So you have to kind of explain why, you know, it's a better way to go about things, whether that be a different way to hold a pitch, a different way to move down the mound, a different way to think about throwing to hitters, things like that. And so when I talk to guys, I'm very cut and dry about it and very honest with guys, right? So like, I feel like that's a piece that's missing a ton in what I see from coaching all the way from what I see, you know, in summer ball with 14, 15 year olds, all the way up to what I see at some high schools and, you know, instruction, things like that. I feel like sometimes I feel like sometimes the emphasis gets put more on making sure everybody feels good when they leave versus, you know, are they going to be better when they leave? And that's not always the same thing, you know? And so sometimes, you know, there's nothing wrong with going up to a player and saying, you know, 
the way you're going about this isn't going to cut it. Like if you don't change the way you're doing things, it's not going to end well for you. Like that's not you being a jerk or talking down to them. That's you telling them that there's a better way to go about things that they need to start changing, you know? And so what ends up happening a lot of times is that when guys get to recruiting age, you know, one of the things that we deal with a lot, for example, is we'll have a kid that is 100% a division three athlete. Like he's right up our alley and we've got, you know, seven guys in the program that are just like this kid, but he's holding out because he's waiting to hear from some power five division one schools that are never coming. But it's because somewhere along the road, somebody told him that he really is that good rather than being honest with him and having a conversation about where he fits in. So I would say for me, I don't know, man, the reason I've been able to have a lot of success working with athletes at different ages is because I treat the 12 year olds just like I treat the 22 year olds like, you know, it's just about different stuff, but it's still the same message. Whereas like, listen, you're doing this this way and it's not working. So we need to figure out a better way to do it. This is a better way to do it. Why don't we try this rather than just being, I think if you just always do nothing but tell everybody that they're great and everything's good and just keep doing what you're doing. Very rarely is that the case And baseball, as you know, Chris, I mean, it's those that change go on and those that don't don't. And that's the way it is. And you have to, at some point, we all have to change the way we do things. And I would say that for me, it's literally just about when I'm working with a player, my goal going into that, the whole reason they're even there to work with me is to get better, not for me to tell them that things that make them feel good. You know, it's to get better. So I'd be doing them a disservice if I just sat there and, and, and told them that everything they're doing is great and, and, you know, didn't make them do anything differently. So, you know, I've always been very, always made it a point to be very honest with kids and very cut and dry with what is going to work for them and what's not and why they need to try something different. And that's the same kind of conversations with the freshmen when they come into college is like, they have to change what they do, you know, or it's never going to change for them. And so, you know, I think I've, I mean, honestly, I found that kids tend to respond a lot better if they know that you actually have their best interests at heart, not just paying lip service to them, telling them that they're great and awesome and everything they're doing is great. I mean, certainly there's time and a place for that, but I found that when players understand that you are bought into making them better, they're going to give you a lot more and you have a lot more productive time with them because it's a common goal because they're there to get better too. So that's always been my approach is just to, I mean, my job is to figure out why they're not where they want to be and help them get there. You know, it's not to tell them that they don't need to change. How important is for these young athletes, in your opinion, to understand to work with being uncomfortable? Yeah, and I think that's, that's, I mean, that's a great point. And I think that that, that point is often misunderstood with people because, you know, there's, that's, I mean, that's thrown out there all the time, right? Like you have to be willing to be uncomfortable and change, which is 100% true. I think that sometimes people take that and they, they kind of liken that to feeling like physically feeling uncomfortable. And usually that's not like, if you're talking about something like a golf swing, like when I was trying to get better at golf, like I had to change some things and it was really uncomfortable because my golf swing was terrible. So I had to do things that were correct and it felt weird. But usually when it comes to like baseball, for example, being uncomfortable a lot of times is more about stepping out of your comfort zone mentally and, and being willing to do something that you're not normally comfortable with. Like, I'll tell you flat out right now that the biggest thing right now with kids coming out of high school into college is that they don't want to throw the ball inside on anybody. Like they just don't want to do it. Like they can't do it. They won't throw the ball inside. And so the thing is like, if you don't throw the ball inside, then you're always dealing with the plate, the size that it is. And our goal is to make the plate bigger so that by the time the second time through the lineup rolls out, the plate's three feet wide because you run the ball under somebody's hands for three innings, you know? So it's a comfort thing for them. It has nothing to do with their delivery or their ability or anything. It's that they've just never done it. And maybe they hit somebody in the back or something and the kid got hurt or something. And like, they freaked out. I don't know, but like, they don't, that's a perfect example of, being willing to be uncomfortable and try something new, you know, or, you know, for hitters, a lot of times, 
you know, they'll come in and tell you that they look for a certain kind of pitch and they don't really handle that pitch, but for some reason they feel like that's the pitch they should be looking for. And so you have to teach them that they need to kind of change the way they do things. And, you know, to the factor of, Hey, listen, man, you're older now. So now the guys on the mound, when they throw the ball here, it's on purpose. Now it's not on accident. So you have to start maybe changing what you do and changing the way you look for things. You know, like, I mean, a great example is I, I had a kid play for me this summer and he's high up on our recruiting list. He's going to be a really good player. He's got some power left-hand hitter, but he's very handsy. Like he's very like, tries to shoot the ball here, shoot the ball here, but he's got such good hands that he can, he can hit really tough pitches and barrel them, but he doesn't, you know, coming into the sum, into the winter season this last year, he, he'd never really hit for any power at all because his focus was, you know, putting the ball in play, not striking out, which are good things. But I had to sit down with him and his father and have the conversation with him that he's going to go, he's going into his junior year at that point. And I'm like, you know, you are a tall, physical first baseman. And nobody is going to give any money to a first baseman that tries to spray the ball all over the field. Like that's not the way the game's played anymore. It was 20 years ago, but now it's like, if you're going to play that spot, you have to be able to hit for some power. So we have to kind of, we have to kind of change the way you do things. So for him, it was all about getting out of the box as early as he could, getting his bat over. First thing he saw in the strike zone, whether it was, you know, a ball down and away or a breaking ball down or something, he was going at it and he'd take his base hits that rolled up the middle or things like that. And I'm like, you know, if you start trusting yourself a little bit and just taking marginal pitches early in the count, you're probably going to find yourself, you know, 2-0, 1-1, 2-1, and you're going to take breaking ball out of play and you're going to get two fastballs to hit. And then all of a sudden, when you've got coaches in the stands there to see you, you're cutting it loose at fastballs up in the zone instead of just, you know, assing out at balls that are down at your knees and taking your hits on the ground. Like nobody wants to see that. Like people want to see balls up in the air off of you. Like they want to see that you can hit for some power. So for him, it was about really starting to trust himself deeper in counts because he didn't at all. Like it was just about, I don't want to strike out. So the first thing I see that gets here in the air, I'm going to put it in play rather than being like, okay, I'm going to box up a pitch right here. And if it's my, like we call it a 600 pitch, like 600, so 60%. So six out of 10 times, if I get this pitch, I'm going to hit it out of the yard. That's the ball we're going to go at 2-0, 1-0, 0 right? So as high school progressed, you know, he started to kind of figure out that there was a whole nother world out there for him if he would just be a little bit more patient and trust himself. So he ran a couple out of the yard and, and he had a really good summer. And now he's got schools calling him, not because he's any different as a person or a player, but because now he's the guy that's going to hit for some power from the left side, which is attractive to schools like, like us. It's not, it's not the guy that just rolls it everywhere, but it took him really, it was hard for him to buy into being patient and not going to just do whatever. And so those kind of things, when you say step outside your comfort zone, like that's, you know, I liken it to yeah. like, I liken it to like a young quarterback, right? When a blitz comes or when, when it's picked up and he's got time, instead of just panicking and going to his first read and getting the ball out, maybe he checks down a little bit and sees the guy running a dig route 20 yards down the field because he's willing to just hang in there, you know? So a lot of times stepping out of your comfort zone is, is just about being willing to try something different, you know? You think and that I, um, <clears throat> there's a, in that is being too tight and too loose. Like, how do you balance that as well? Like a player who's too tight and just can't get out of his comfort zone as opposed to how do you balance as a coach getting some of these kids looser? And that right there is why the special ones are special, right? Because they, you know, they can do things like that, right? Like they, you know, a, a certain portion of it for sure falls on the athlete, you know? And like, it's it's kind of that, that cash 22, right? Like are the best coaches in the country with the best programs. They're, uh, they're undoubtedly unbelievable coaches, but they also have the best players, right. That can, that can focus and stay calm and do things like that. And that what you just said is a perfect way of illustrating 
the difference between like a player we would get and a player that like Oregon State gets or UCLA gets because those kind of guys can sit there and be loose and go 0 for 2 and be like, oh, I need to change mid-game right now what I'm doing. Boom, and they'll change it and go hit a jack and win a game. Whereas our guys tend to be a little bit more, take a little bit more time to be able to make those types of adjustments on the fly. So as a coach, I think that the most important thing is to, is to like when I'll mentor young coaches, what I'll say to them is like, hey, you have to set clear expectations from the beginning, like day one, have to set clear expectations, whatever that is you know, like ours is at the school and our staff, like we're going to create movement with every pitch. We're going to, we're going to win in some regard on every pitch that we throw. So if we throw a ball, we need to gain something out of it. We need to gain forward movement. We need to gain, you know, movement away from the plate, something that's going to open up a hole somewhere else. If we don't, then we're just wasting, we're wasting bullets at that point. So we're going to compete for everything. We're going to work ahead and we're going to just like, what I tell the guys all the time is that, you know, it needs to feel like hitters are Oh one when they get in the box, like you're just pounding the strike zone. So I think as a coach to help guys relax, I think a big piece of it is just clear expectations of what they're doing and just being consistent so that their preparation is the same all the time. Right. So that when they're in games, I mean, they're prepared. So you trust, you know, you, when you're in tense moments and pressure filled moments, you, you, you lean back on your training and your practice. That's what you do, right? So everybody, everybody falls back to the point of their training. So if you're not prepared, when it's time to make changes and adjust and do things like that, I mean, it takes forever because you're just mentally not ready for it. And then you get punched in the face and then you're, you're done. But if you have worked on things and those changes have come early and you've been working and you trust the progress you've made and the practice you've done, then there's no reason to there's no reason to worry about anything because you can be calm in that moment because you know exactly what what you're doing you know it's like you know for me like oddly enough like with my golf game one of the hardest things for me has been like like my like chips inside of like 30 yards around the green like i think i probably like sculled a ball one day and like it just got in here and it just didn't go out so like I had to sit there and literally just take my wedge to a range and just chip and chip and chip till pretty soon I saw I could do it. And there was no reason, there was no problem. And then it was fine, but I had to make myself uncomfortable mentally in order to do that. So I think as coaches, our job is to set expectations immediately, identify issues that need to be fixed and then just be very consistent with it. And once players experience success, they're fine. Like they just need to see that it's okay and that they're going to be able to do it. And our job as coaches is to get them to that point where they're okay trying something new, then they see success and then it's fine. They're fine doing whatever because they're having success. So I think that it's just so important to get kids to a point where they feel confident in what's going on. And you do that by early on, you know, pointing out better ways to do things, letting them start slowly and have success and then work their way into it. You know, Michael Jordan used to say, like on that 30 for 30 doc or on the last dance thing, one of my favorite parts of that man, he said that game time for him was easier than practice because he did things so hard all the time in practice every day. So he knew that when it was time to perform, it was no big deal at all because he'd done it a thousand times in practice. He'd changed what he did, he did things differently. And so he had no worries. He knew he could do it. And so our job as coaches is not necessarily to get them to a point where they can succeed. I mean, ultimately that's the goal, but our job is to make them feel like it's okay. And it's going to be fine because they can do it because they've done it so many times now and they're doing it the right way at practice. You know, I saw, I tell the guys all the time and at the school, like you guys are ready. You guys are ready. Like in the commerce tournament last year, I mean, we ultimately fell short in it, but we pitched really well and going into the commerce tournament that week leading up to it, you know, we barely snuck in and I'm like, listen, like, you guys, I know we've had, and we were on like a, like a cliff pitching wise at the end of the year. Like we went from leading the conference in ERA and like being ranked 12th in the country to like barely getting in because all of a sudden we would have one blow opening every game. And it was like, you know, and as a coach, if you let it get there, all of a sudden everything's moving a hundred miles an hour and everybody's head spinning when really it's really not that big of a deal. Like it's really just maybe just a better pitch here or a better pitch there. And I feel like as a coach, my job at that point was to make sure everybody understands that 
we were plenty good enough to get it done. We just needed to execute a little bit better, the same game plan that we'd done a thousand times, you know, and all of a sudden it became possible again. Nobody was panicking because everybody understood that it really wasn't like, we just really weren't executing like maybe five pitches in a game. And it was just creating a, you know, a landslide rather than man, we're, we're shitty now. We can't do anything right. That wasn't the case at all. Like, it was just like, we need to take a breath and trust that we had worked really hard all year long to put ourselves in that position. People had changed. They'd started doing things differently, you know, and then we went out and threw it really well because we were those guys and we just needed a little bit to take a breath and, and realize that, you know, they'd worked really hard for that. So that was the message was, I mean, you guys have all earned the right to have success here because you've all changed. You've all done things differently and work really hard at it. So games are, I mean, that's your time to just enjoy it and go and go shine. What's your superstition? Baseball? Yep. Uh, it actually is on the fly. Like if we have a really good inning, I will look back to what I did before that inning. And I will do the same thing then before every single inning until we have a bad inning. So like if there's two kids down at the end of the dugout and for some reason on my way back down the dugout, I fist bumped both of them and then we go strike out the side. I'm going to make them sit in that same spot. I'm going to fist bump them on my way down the dugout every single inning. Like, I love and, it, that. and listen, I'm not proud of it, but it runs deep, bro. Like last year we had a kid that like threw a two hitter in a big game for us. And in the first inning, because I always mark off what happens for us offensively on the lineup card so that we know where we're at. And so after each hitter, I'll go lineup. In the last inning, I had like, I wrote in whatever the guy did. And then after each time, for some reason, I don't know why, I just clicked, I'd flip the pen around and I'd click the button on the end twice on the lineup card. And then we went out in the bottom of the first and punched out the side and the third hit, the three hole guy in the lineup is somebody that has just literally murdered us for three years. And we went out and punched him out on three pitches and executed every single one of them. And I was like, well, shit, now I got to hit the friggin' pen on the lineup card twice every time I, so I did every single time, every time. And so he threw a two hitter that day. So that was my thing then until we threw like crap. And then I had to find a new thing, but it like literally like, you know, every time, like it, whatever's working is working. Like you don't screw with things when they're working. That's my big thing. And I tell the kids that too, man, like, if we throw from a different mound in our home bullpen before the game, like last year, like we had like a hole developing before it was fixed and one of the turf mounds down there. And so we had to move over one and the kid went out and shoved that day. And the next time he threw, he lined up on that same crappy mound. And I'm like, what in the hell are we doing right now? Like you need to go stand on that other mound and throw your pregame pen. Like you don't screw with things when they're working. Like that's lunacy. I could totally see you saying that, dude, what the hundred percent the best is because he's a coach. We ask these players this, and it's always about the, you know, you don't step on the line. Oh, yeah, it's a big one, too. You hear that yeah. all the time, right? Yeah. But you can't do that. Yeah. But he's got these, like, you don't change a good thing. Yeah. You don't but, breathe. You just hold your breath. Until... That's it. You know, it, it could be like we had a closer a couple of years ago that was just on a roll. He ended up being an all-region guy, and he just, like, he struggled early, and then he just caught fire. And he caught fire when we were on the road and he walked on the bus that day to go to the field on day one and he woke up late or something. So like he woke, he, he walked on the bus with his breakfast. Right. And he ate like, he had like a bowl of like, I don't know, like frosted flakes and a banana and he ate it in the back of the bus. And then he just, he saved both games on Saturday and was lights out. And the next day he comes on the bus with nothing. And I'm like, this is garbage. I'm like, you can't pitch today. I'm like, <laughs> you either walk, <laughs> I'm like you either oh my I, god i love I it i stopped him at the front of the bus and i'm like you either walk back into the lobby right now and go get frosted flakes and a banana or you can't pitch today like this is crap like you have to give yourself a chance to be like you have to give yourself a chance oh that's so good oh uh, sean oh hey, my brother. god we are that's so great thank, thank, you, thank you so much from all of us here at what up sports nation thank you have a great day and a better tomorrow